However, hurt can be that brief. <laughs> As we continue our lectures this morning uh, regarding the gospel of Christ, so far we've heard two good gospel sermons. It's my prayer, and probably yours too, you'll hear a third. <laughs> so we'll continue with the uh, honored practice of learning about this important topic using a Bible-based 3Rs methodology. Repetition, repetition, and repetition. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. My assignment this morning is to speak to you regarding the gospel overthrows the practice of sin, or more precisely, we're going to be speaking about repenting of sin. Assuming that most of us here today have heard the gospel, and thus searched the scriptures, and used our God-given intellect and ability to reason, and we have thus believed the gospel and that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God, but in our search for the scriptures, we learn that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and thus concluded that the word all included ourselves. We learned that sin separates man from God, had a couple good lessons here on that. The prophet wrote in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear can hear, uh, hear. It's heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Sin not only separates us from God, sin separates us from one another. Because those who have separated themselves from God have in turn separated themselves from God's children. When these lectures end today, you should be able to go out into the lost and dying world, as well to brethren that have fallen back into sin, and explain to them the fallacies of their sin, their love for it, how to do away with the practice of sin, how to erase the guilt and power it has over them, and very importantly, how the gospel and the obedience of it answers the consequences of sinning against God. So since all have sinned and fallen and come short of the glory of God, then there is a need for repentance. The gospel of Jesus Christ answers the problem of the practice of sins by commanding us to repent. Thus, from sin to the need of repentance, this brings us to my topic, the gospel overthrows the practice of sin. And as we'll see, repenting of sin is where we begin our conquest over the practice of sin. So the obvious question, of course, this morning that could be asked is what is repentance? You know, in Greek, repentance literally means a change of mind, a turning, but the meaning goes much deeper than that. It is a change of direction in mind, in heart, and in your life. It is a conscience turning from self, from sin, from the serving of Satan, and turning back to God. The Apostle Paul, preaching to, uh, in Athens, proclaimed the gospel to the people who needed to hear about the unknown God. They needed to know about the one who created all things, who gives us life, breath, and the one in whom we live and move and have our being. They, as well as all men, needed to hear about God's plan for their lives. Paul declared in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men, everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead 
after this bold declaration, Luke shows for all times the response of the people. There were some who mocked the resurrection of the dead and the gospel of Christ. There were some who said, we will hear thee again on this matter, putting off a decision to obey the gospel and procrastination. Verse 32. However, a certain man clave unto him and believed. Verse 34. God demands repentance. Those who receive the word with gladness and with good and honest hearts will obey the gospel of Jesus, and they will repent of their sins. Jesus commanded the people repent of their sins in order to be saved. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now one might think that surely this requirement from the Savior of the world would bring about the repentance of men. But sadly, that's not the case. Few respond quickly to the Master's word. In Matthew 23, verse 37, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered you, thy children, together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. The multitudes that followed Christ for food and for healing left him when they found out that there was a cost to living a Christian life. The Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us to come home. He wants our fellowship. And He wants us to enjoy fellowship with one another. God wants us to repent whereby we can have it so. God's desire for our repentance is written for all mankind in His revealed Word. The Bible is the number one selling book in the world, of all time actually. And it continues to be the number one uh, selling book in the world. One survey actually said that 90% of the American households own at least one Bible. However, just because people claim to believe in God and own one or more copies of the Bible does not mean that they're willing to submit their lives to the truth that's taught in God's Word. Very few are willing to examine their lives, repent of their sins, and turn to God. J.W. McGarvey, in his book of sermons, said that the greatest obstacle to salvation is man's obstinance, meaning his stubbornness. In his excellent sermon on repentance, McGarvey suggested that if he were to ask individuals, what is repentance? that he would probably get from a lot of people the answer that it is godly sorrow. And that he said that would be a very imperfect definition. And it's a common mistake for some people. Godly sorrow is not repentance, but it produces repentance. There is no repentance without sorrow for sin, and it is impossible for any man to sorrow for them too deeply. But that is not the exact thing in the Bible that's called repentance. We know this from a single statement from the Apostle Paul when addressing certain men in Corinth. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, and he said there, according to the American Standard Version, for though I made you sorry with my epistle, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the epistle made you sorry, though but for a reason, for a season. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorry after a godly sort, that you might suffer loss by us in nothing, 
For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, a repentance which brings no regret, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Paul had awakened a very keen sorrow in their hearts with his letter. He pitied them when he learned how deeply distressed they were after reading his letter. But when he learned that this godly sorrow worked repentance, then he was glad that he had made them sorry. And his, his remark shows that repentance is a result of godly sorrow. Not sorrow itself, but godly sorrow. There is a such a thing as the sorrow of the world, the definition, but I mean, uh, the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow is that worldly sorrow is a selfish kind of sorrow. It comes about when one is sorry because he got caught. <laughs> when one is sorry because of what he did made himself look bad. That's a lot of worldly, uh, worldly sorrow in the penal systems of America and elsewhere. Bottom line, worldly sorrow is concerned about oneself. But godly sorrow is directed toward God because of one's sins against Him. A person is sorry because their actions are sins against our holy God. You see this in the attitude of David in Psalms 51 verse 4. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Also, one is sorry because of the price God had to pay to have our sins removed by sending His only Son to the cross to die for our sins. So worldly sorrow produces regret for self and spiritual death. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation and life. So as McGarvey suggested, Saying repentance is godly sorrow for sin is a flawed definition. This being the case, McGarvey said that some scholars have concluded that repentance is reformation of life. But we learn from John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, that reformation of life, instead of being repentance, is the fruit of repentance. So we're going to look at some of the signs of repentance. The result of repentance is a changed life, a reformed life, a converted life. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 shows that repentance and conversion are two separate things. Here Peter says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Peter says to repent and be converted. He's not being redundant, rather one leads to the other. Repentance leads to conversion, a reformation of life. In Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, John had the uh, said to the multitude that came to submit to his baptism of repentance for remission of sins, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Some of the people said, Master, what shall we do then? And John went on to say, He that hath two coats, let him impart to one that hath none. He that hath meat, to do likewise. John told them to be generous with their material blessings and be kind. The publicans also said, Master, what shall we do? And John told them to exact no more than is appointed you. Uh, they were in the habit of demanding more <laughs> and putting the surplus in their pocket. John instructed them to quit their wicked conduct. Then the soldiers asked John, Well, what shall we do? And John replied, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And thus... In calling on them to bring forth works of repentance, John explained that he meant better conduct, a change, a reformation in their lives. So then, a change in life is the 
for the better is the result or an effect of repentance. It is not repentance itself. Repentance then is something that stands in between godly sorrow for sin and the change of life in which sins are abandoned and a better course of conduct begins. So then, what exactly is repentance? McGarvey went on in his sermon to explain that repentance is a change of that stubborn will which is the seat of all rebellion and all sin against God. When a man is so thoroughly filled with godly sorrow and mourning for his sins and self-reproach on account of his sins, that his will is subdued to the will of God, and he says, I will sin no more. I will hereafter submit to the will of my God. That is repentance. A change of our will, will in regard to sin. And this results in a changed life. A life in which the practice of sin is abandoned and overthrown, if you will, and a better way of conduct and living is begun according to the scriptures. To the alien sinner, this means that upon learning the gospel truth that he must come to an understanding of knowing that his sins have separated him from God. Then suffering from godly sorrow for that, he repents, changing his stubborn will to submit to the will of God. He is then able to show forth the fruit of repentance with a changed life that includes confessing Jesus as his Lord and baptism for the remission of sins. Then as he continues to learn and grow and live faithfully according to the scriptures, he enjoys fellowship with God and the faithful brethren in the Lord's church. To the child of God that is sin, who has once again rebelled against the will of God, he must also understand that his sin has separated him from God again. And suffering godly sorrow come to the knowledge that he needs to repent, change his stubborn will, return to submitting to the will of God. He then is able to show forth the fruit of repentance with a changed life, putting behind him the sin he committed, continue living faithfully, and once more, again, in fellowship with God, and the faithful in Christ. What is so hard about repentance to understand? The simplicity of the gospel shows forth the love of God for man. It is man who makes compliance difficult. For those in sin who have heard and understood the gospel truth are those who know the truth and once obeyed it. Only their stubborn will stands between them and repentance. Having therefore defined repentance, how it is produced by godly sorrow and how it results in the reformed life, a change of life for the better, as the Bible defines the better, <laughs> understanding what repentance is, we're going to take some time now to look at some misconceptions about repentance. And I'm going to have to kind of build on this a little bit, so bear with me. There are many misconceptions about repentance, especially in unauthorized denominations, but also in some of the wayward churches of Christ who have strayed from the straight and narrow which leads unto life, Matthew 7, 14. This might be a good time to recall a couple of biblical principles before we launch into this topic. First, God's word is truth. King David said that righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Thy law is the truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. John, uh, Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. You know, I made a note of something David said a long time ago, and I committed it to memory. And I've, most of you I've ever done a Bible study with have heard me say it. Truth is just what a thing is, nothing more, nothing less. You know, that statement alone helps to explain why witnesses take an oath in our court systems today. Tell the truth, that's just what a thing is, 
The whole truth, meaning nothing less, and nothing but the truth, meaning nothing more. One cannot add to or take from the truth and expect to have the truth in the end. Hence the warning in the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments is not to add or take away from God's Word. Deuteronomy 4, 2, 12, 32 and Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. We might also remember that truth has certain attributes, one of which it is that truth cannot contradict itself. Eventually, ungodly beliefs, including denominational teachings and practices of men, will contradict the simple, plain teachings of the Bible, and truth cannot contradict itself. Thus, their teachings must be an error. The second principle we may want to call to mind is that of a biblical authority. One of the many failings of man today is the unwillingness to acknowledge that Bible authority is to be recognized as being absolute. It is sad to realize that many today, and even some members of the large church, will argue that one does not need authority for all that he does in religion. Yet the Apostle Paul sets forth the principle regarding the necessity of authority that will be as binding as long as the earth stands and is right up here before you every day. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him, Colossians 3.17. I find it particularly ironic that this verse follows Colossians 3.16 that identifies the kind of music, vocal singing, that is authorized by God and consistently mentioned in connection with New Testament worship, but is an issue in almost every sectarian denomination, so much for submitting to the will of God, the crux of repentance. To do something in the name of the Lord is to do it by His authority. Any teaching or preaching that's not authorized by God is in vain. We must not allow traditions of men to make the commandments of God to of no effect. Jesus charged the Pharisees with vain worship for doing this in Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 13. In view of this warning, we should evaluate our religious practices and ask, are they based upon the traditions of men or the commandments of God? If they're based upon the traditions of men, does our keeping them render the commands of God of no effect? Our Lord and Savior has all authority. The words of Christ should not be clearer than when he stated, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Or when God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Matthew 17, verse 5. Jesus drives this through, uh, truth home by saying, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, verse 48. So that said, let's consider sectarian denominational teachings regarding repentance. Actually, there are too many to consider. <laughs> And so I will limit this to looking at a few of the major de denominations and that we're probably all likely familiar with. And by the way, to say there are too many is an understatement. It's been reported that there existed roughly 43,000 Christian denominations worldwide in 2012. And they're estimating it will be uh, expected to grow to 55,000 by the year 2025. Buddy, uh, that means that there's a new Christian denomination formed every ten and a half hours every day. You know, whether that's accurate or not, accurate side, they get the idea. There's a lot of them. And I don't know them all, and I don't have the time to know them all. So I went to that fount of knowledge and misinformation, the Internet, and I looked up on a site called learnreligions.com. And I looked under the topic of means of salvation. 
And I looked at the major denominations, the uh, Anglican, the Episcopalian, Assembly of God, the Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. I figured I'd limit it to that. And understand there are many divisions within these main denominations, having many nuances and many beliefs, varying beliefs. But they primarily profess the following regarding the means of salvation. God's grace by faith only. I'm not sure to understand the meaning of only, since there seems to be two things listed there, grace and faith. But anyway, I'm pretty sure when Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In Matthew 4.10, he didn't mean uh, the Lord thy God and something else too. Uh, the word rendered only in that verse is monos, which according to Strong's uh, means soul or single or by implication alone, only, or by themselves. And we see this again in James uh, chapter 2, verse 24, where James writes, You see that uh, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. The word rendered only there is the neuter adverb, the same word, monos, that we just read in Matthew 4.10, meaning merely, alone, or only. This doesn't give us a lot of confidence in their means of salvation statement nor their ability to account. But regarding baptism, when asked who can be baptized on this same site, these folks, majority of them say infants and professing Christians. Now the Assembly of God will say only professing Christians. But with them, you have to wonder if they're speaking of water baptism, baptism by the Holy Spirit, or both. Um, Baptists declare, uh, also declare only professing Christians. But with them, you have to question the mode, as many believe in sprinkling or pouring, and perhaps, if requested by the person being baptized, by immersion. I mention all these things because the nominational teachings and practices vary and will contradict the simple, plain teachings of the Bible. And as we said, truth cannot contradict itself. And then there is the question of the second principle we spoke about, which is biblical authority. Many of these practices are based on the tradition of men, not the commandments of God. And we asked earlier, if traditions of men, does keeping them render the commands of God of no effect? I submit to you the answer to that is yes. Yes, it does. Bible plainly teaches that we are not saved by faith alone at the point of belief, nor is there any authority for sprinkling or pouring when baptizing someone. Baptism is an immersion, thus there is no authority for anything else. I have yet to see or hear of a sinful infant who understands the gospel, comes to believe it, repents, confesses Christ as Lord before being baptized. And it is all just a bunch of contradictory, unauthorized nonsense when you look at it. Now, regarding sectarian denomination of teachings regarding repentance, you just thought all that other was a mess. Trying to understand what denominations teach and practice about repentance is like, as one speaker here before said, like trying to nail jello to a wall. We already see that they do not respect the authority of God's truth and are themselves not submitting to the will of God, the core of repentance, in the matters we just listed. Why would we expect them to submit to the will of God regarding repentance? Most denominations will list turning from sin as their definition of repentance. Some will mention godly sorrows that cause returning to sin, and most, most of them actually mention that repentance will lead to reformed life. However, there is no real depth to their definition. That's what they say, but what do they do? We know that repentance is produced by godly sorrow and how repentance results in a reformed life as the Bible defines a reformed life. But what do we see when we look closer at sectarian denomination? Let's pick one and examine it a little closer. For example, Methodist beliefs. Going back to my fount of knowledge and misinformation, uh, learnreligions.com, and looking at the Methodist church beliefs and practices, we learn the following regarding their belief on baptism. And I quote, 
Baptism is a sacrament or ceremony in which a person is anointed with water to symbolize their being brought into the community of faith. The water of baptism may be administered by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. Baptism is symbolic of repentance and inner cleansing from sins, a rebirth in the name of Christ and dedication to Christian discipleship. Methodists believe baptism is God's gift at any age, but should be performed as soon as possible. You know, before we compared that erroneous statement with God's truth, I found it interesting that on the same page that Methodist baptism doctrine that I just read was spelled out under, under the heading of logic and reason right below it, the following was proclaimed, and I quote, The most fundamental distinction of the Methodist teaching is that people must use logic and reason in all matters of faith, end quote. Well, using logic and reason, let's see what's actually taught in the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of the Lord's church began, the inspired Luke tells us that the apostle Peter commanded believers in Christ to repent, be baptized for the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38. Not to symbolize being brought into a community of faith. Those who gladly received the word preached to them were baptized, and the Lord added them to uh, the saves his church, Acts 2.41 and verse 47. Not the Methodist me uh, denomination, by the way, his church. You know, Paul tells us that baptism puts us all into Christ. Uh, Galatians 3.27, where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1.3, forgiveness of sins, sonship being two of those blessings. And Peter plainly stated and said that baptism does now also save us. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. I want you to note, however, that Peter, nor any inspired writer or a faithful gospel preacher, has taught that baptism alone will save anyone any more than faith alone or repentance alone or confession of Christ alone will save one from sin. Figure out what I want to cut out here. We're all familiar, we just heard a while ago the pre, uh, this, uh, about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Of course, he asked the question, the important question, here's water, what doth hindered me to be baptized? And then, you know, because Philip began there preaching to him from the scriptures he's reading in Isaiah, uh, not only the purpose and promises of Jesus, but also must have preached the teachings of Jesus, including beliefs that Jesus is the Son of God, and repentance, but also baptism for remission of sins to obtain salvation. So with the confession of Jesus uh, being the Son of God on his lips, then nothing remained but to be baptized. And in response, they both of them went down to the water and filled and baptized him. Baptism is a burial. You've all heard this. I'm just bringing it to your rem uh, remembrance. A part of new birth. Sprinkling and pouring does not fulfill the meaning of the Greek term for baptism, which signifies an immersion, a going down into, a coming up out of. In general, most denominational churches do not believe, teach, practice, or practice that one who believes in Christ must be baptized by immersion in water by the authority of Christ to be saved from one's sins. This is the case because most denominational churches erroneously teach that people are saved by Jesus before baptism and they are baptized for some other reason. And that's a lie. That's a sin. So much for turning from sin as they define repentance. The Bible teaches a person who has believed in Christ, repented of one's sins, confessed one's faith in Christ, must then be baptized by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins. There's no other way but Christ's way. More than these essential steps in the plan of salvation, Christ does not demand of one seeking salvation from sins. But anything less than what is taught, and one remains lost in their sins. Question. Has any person who remains a member of a denomination actually really and truly repented 
If so, why haven't they changed their stubborn will, which is the seed of all rebellion, and submitted to the will of God? Have they truly repented that they continue in an unauthorized sectarian denomination? And if they continue to preach and teach and worship contrary to the truth of God, wherein one is sanctified, John 17:17, 17, 17, do they think the fruits of repentance include disobedience by not doing in word or deed, all in the name of the Lord by His authority, Colossians 3.17. All sectarian denominations have their erroneous teachings and problems. The primary one being that they're not authorized in God's Word. For example, concerning the Catholic Church, the concept of a Pope ruling over their church, infant baptism, how they're organized, Mary worship, and any other such practices that are contrary to the plain teachings of God's truth as given in the Bible. How about the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, also known as the ELCA, the largest Lutheran church body in the United States, which allows for LGBTQ plus ordination of clergy and marriage. Uh, their policy states that these individuals are welcome and encouraged to become members to participate in the life of the congregation Never mind if they continue in sin. They even provide supplemental resources that, uh, for the right of marriage and worship that uses inclusive language and are suitable for use in LGBTQ plus marriage ceremonies. Does it sound like these people repent? No. In 2014, the Presbyterian Church, USA, voted to change the definition of marriage, allowing its pastors to officiate same-sex marriages wherever gay marriage is legal and civil law, though it plainly contradicts God's law. I could go on, but let me ask this of the preceding descriptions of various denominations. Where is the godly sorrow for their sin? They continue to practice sin contrary to God's word. Where's the changing of their stubborn will to, su to submit to the will of God? Where's the turning from sin, as their definition of repentance said? They do whatever they will concerning religion, contrary to the will of God. Where's the evidence showing forth the fruit of repentance with a changed life as God's truth defines a changed life? David, I'm having a hard time seeing it. But I do see this. First, perverting the truth and teaching false doctrine does not produce true repentance. And second, you cannot be taught wrong, devoted to practicing spiritual error, and be baptized right. But we have a repentance problem in the church also. One other aspect of repentance must be noted. Confession of sins by itself does not equal repentance. There are many in the Lord's church who confess sin in their lives. They ask for the prayers of the saints, and then they never make the necessary changes in their life. How often have we seen people go forward for sins? Probably one of the most common ones is forsaking the assembly only to quietly sip, slip right back out of duty. You know, quite often when the preacher gets up on the pulpit and reaches the conclusion of his sermon, a member will be struck by their own guilt. And they'll walk up the aisle and they'll make a confession of sin. But when that emotion of guilt fades in a few days, all too often, they go right back to where they were before. The problem? Confession of sin by itself does not equal repentance. There must be godly sorrow that produces repentance for the sin that they committed. Meaning a changing of their stubborn will to submit to the will of God. Then we should see the fruits of repentance. A reformation in their life. If not, that person's repentance was short-circuited by the cares of this world or it never truly 
existed in the first place. You know, in summary, we'll sum this up. I don't want to be accused of holding everybody away from me. <laughs> I don't want to be accused of keeping you from lunch. In summary, how does the gospel overthrow the practice of sin? Repentance is a key element in doing so. Repentance is a change of man's stubborn will, which is the seed of all rebellion and all sin against God. A change to submit to the will of God in all things. And I know because of my own self, you're going to slip. But you're going to have to recognize when you do, you have to understand that you've sinned and you're going to have to change your stubborn will and repent and change. But by obeying the gospel of Christ, submitting our wills to the will of God in all things, in word or deed, just like we see right up here, which is the essence of repentance, the gospel overthrows the practice of sin. Thank you for your time.